What is up squad, it is your squid, aka Jill Centauri, the anxious squid, coming at you with another one of your favourites, a video for the Storytime playlist, video number five in that playlist I think, uh, which consists of Australian history stories that I find interesting and hope to entertain you with, or at the very least inform you about, because I think there's a, a severe lack in Australian history at the moment uh, on YouTube. This video is a bit of a longer one, so strap yourselves in, uh, it's another one stemming from my hometown area of the Wallandilly, which is just in here. So, I hope you like watching it as much as I liked researching it. This video is about soldiers making friendships while they were at war. It's about sons emulating fathers and more. This video is about the life and death of Henry Antle, the founder of Picton in New South Wales, Australia. Before we jump into our YouTubular DeLoreans and travel through metaphorical time at 88 miles per hour on the interwebs, I just want to give myself and you a quick shout out here. Uh, this channel's been going just short of three months now and I'm smashing all the goals I had for this time frame in terms of watch time, subscriptions, um, and yeah, at the time of recording this there are over 130 people who went out of their way to make sure they could see what I post, when I post it. And given I do all this myself, from researching and script writing, to graphic design, to finding sponsors for the reaction videos, and also filming and editing and uploading all the content, I, um, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone who's hung around thus far. I also want to say a big g'day to the people who haven't had a chance to stick around yet, because this is the first time they've stumbled across one of my videos. Welcome. I'll be doing a Q&A video and uh, launching my Patreon when I hit 150 subscribers. Uh, and I'm not far off that target at all now, so get some questions in using the comments section below uh, or using Instagram or Facebook, my name's the same on both of those. If you haven't already, the subscribe button's just down there. Give it a tickle, uh, then let's get cracking on this history, shall we? As I've said multiple times on this channel, short of the Big Bang, there's not a single thing in the universe, material or otherwise, that exists without a context for its existence. I like to think of context as a sort of lens to view things in. If you change any particular part of the context in your mind when you're looking back through history, you can change how you view or perceive people's actions or motivations. In the last video for this playlist, I tried to provide a new context for John MacArthur to be viewed in. In this one, I'll be trying to give you a context for Henry Antle's life, why he ended up being the founder of Picton, and why he was buried standing upright. Henry Antle was born in New York in 1779 in what we know as the United States of America. On the surface level, Antil and I are the opposite of each other. He was a child in New York and eventually moved to what we call Wallandilly. I was a child in the Wallandilly and eventually moved to New York, where I am right now. I'm just saying, it's quirks like these ones that make me so interested in local history, I think. Um, I, I feel like people are more able to imagine themselves in a bygone time if they already know the rough resemblance of the not-so-bygone place. Uh, maybe that's just me, but given that you're watching my content, I doubt I'm alone in thinking that way. Um, anyway, anyway, as I said before, Henry Antill was born in New York in a tumultuous time for the country we now know as America. The Revolutionary Wars for American Independence were in full swing at the time of his birth, uh, and it's, it's impossible to say just how far-reaching or butterfly effecty uh, the flow-on effects of that revolution were or still are to this day. For, for those that aren't up on their American history, the Declaration of Independence was signed three years prior to Antill's birth in 1776. A British surrender to the revolutionaries and thus acceptance of their independence wouldn't come until two years after Antill was born in 1781. One might say that Henry Antill was a baby boomer before he even knew what a war-related baby boom was, but that's a different story. Henry's father, John Antill, fought on the side of the British during the Revolutionary Wars for America's independence. And as a result of losing said war, he and the others who were loyal to the Crown had their lands confiscated by the new government of the day. The Antill family were forced to move from New York to somewhere in Canada, which at the time was still under British rule and I guess technically still is, but like, not really. Same as Australia. I mean, the Queen isn't even in charge in England anymore. But, um, but yeah, given what we know about Henry Antill's ca uh, career path and the life he led, uh, I think these times spent shifting location in his very early life were pivotal to the forming and foundation of his character. Uh, th there was no U-Haul back then 
remember. So it would have been a hefty process for the family to go through and picking up their lives like that, uh, especially to move specifically as a result of war. Um, if it had happened in modern times, the Antils might even be referred to as refugees in that circumstance. Uh, as such, Henry considered himself a loyal British subject, as his father John had before him. Um, I believe the actions he'd take to end up in the Wallandilly are emblematic of that assessment, but you let me know in the comments section below what you think, because uh, as I say in every video, I'm always open to interpretations and I'd love to hear what you think. The surface level effects of Britain losing the war with America though, uh, were in a nutshell that Britain was broke and no longer had the tax dollars coming in from what was no longer their colony. Uh, they'd basically been back to back warring with either France or America, uh, or both, for, for over a decade, and things weren't looking too crash hot for King George III in terms of his leadership. Uh, the wider reaching problem for Georgie 3.0 was that they no longer had the American colonies uh, to ship jailbirds to from mainland England when they ran out of room in their prisons. Um, what that meant was the river in the middle of London was starting to get really smelly as a result of it being chock full of convicts on boats because they'd run out of room in their prisons. Um, the King fixed that problem by sending prisoners to Australia, and we will come back to that shortly. Given the choices young men often make to try and emulate their father's lives, um, when Henry Antill was old enough it should come as no surprise to you that he joined His Majesty's Royal Army, as his father had. Specifically, Antill started his career as an ensign in the 73rd Regiment. To be perfectly frank, I couldn't find many sources about Antil's early career, and I don't know, even know what an ensign is other than lowest rank you can have, according to Google, um, but boy did I stumble onto something I thought was fun and interesting during the middle ground of his career. During his time as a 20-something year old soldier in India, in fact, somewhere near the end of 1799, Antil was hurt in his shoulder pretty badly and he had to retire from active duty. Or his so shoulder was hurt for him, likely by someone just trying to protect their homeland, but you get my point. Uh, there's plenty more videos that get into the horrors of colonialism on YouTube. Look them up if you want. Uh, I'm not focusing on it right now, but I promise I will at some point. So the shoulder injury led Antil to becoming a lieutenant, which in turn led him to spending more time with his captain, who was also in India. Though he did have far loftier career goals than just being captain of the 73rd, Antil would attach himself to that man and their pursuits would be heavily linked from that point forward. Oh, and that bloke, by the way? The captain of Antill's regiment? None other than Lachlan Macquarie, who incidentally is the only New South Wales governor most people nowadays can name without watching a Sean Connery movie beforehand. That was a William Bly joke. Um, the two formed a strong friendship. I'd go as far to say that they were best mates even. Uh, the close nature of their friendship is, is not just evidenced by almost a lifetime of Antill and Macquarie working together from that point on. Uh, but it, it, also, numerous other things, such as Antil's firstborn son having the middle name of Macquarie, Antil naming the first estate in Picton Jarvisfield Estate after Macquarie's first wife Jane Jarvis, who died of TB while they were all in India, um, and many more. Antil was appointed the title of aide-de-camp to the governor upon his arrival in Australia, just a couple of short years after he'd hurt his shoulder in India. An aide-de-camp was basically a combination of what we know as a personal assistant and a hype man. Uh, his job was to accompany Macquarie on expeditions and assist however he could, uh, keep a record of meetings and the organisational structure, be the governor's ears, and yeah, I suppose, pump up Lockie Macquarie whenever he needed to. Lachlan, sorry. After the Rum Rebellion, and I will do a video on that eventually, I promise, it's probably fair to say that Antil had the most knowledge and influence in the entire colony for a period of time, and from all my research, he seems like he was a pretty good dude, because... I can't find anything too bad that he did with said influence. I expect a lot of people will have been wanting me to touch on his pastoral pursuits or his farming prowess in this video, but to be honest with you, I'm far more impressed with Antil away from that scope. Uh, Henry Antil was involved in various committees promoting the welfare of orphans, ex-convicts, Aboriginal people, and more. How effective those committees were is another question, but um, he was definitely trying, which is more than can be said for most people in that time period. He was right on board with Lachlan Macquarie and the Emancipist movement, obviously, considering they were besties, um, but what that meant was that once a convict had served their sentence, he would view them as a normal human being, with 
desires and aims and, and, you know, a life instead of a lower class citizen intended forever to be his slave or indentured servant. This would become a sore point for some other free settlers nearby, notably the MacArthur's, uh, but you'll have to watch my other videos if you want to be, hear about what they thought about convicts. Um, truth be told, I don't actually know why Henry Anthill was buried upright. I mean, as far as I can tell, no one does, and I'm sorry for the clickbaity headline on that one, but it is true that he was buried standing upright, and I do find that quirky. Some historians suggest it was because of a desire for, uh, of his to forever be surveying his land, even after death, though, to be honest with you, I don't think that sounds like the bloke I've been researching. He seems a little bit more humble than that. Others suggest it was an attempt by Henry to hoodwink the legal system, with the initial land grants being given to the Antill family so long as he stood. Um, and if you take that reason to be true, it relies on someone at some point after he died saying, well, he got us there, he's technically still standing, and, and that does make me chuckle, but I'm highly doubtful it was that either. If you know why for sure, let me know in the comments section below, because I am fascinated by this bloke and I would love to do an updated video. Um, Henry Antill wrote his journals on his way to Australia, as well as uh, on a journey to try and find a path over the Blue Mountains with Macquarie & Co. once he'd arrived here. Uh, he wrote about a trip to Van Diemen's Land, which is now ta Tasmania, as I'm sure you all know, uh, and a couple of other official expeditions along, the, on his, along his way he journaled as well. Uh, astonishingly to me, we as Australians apparently still have all of Henry Antill's journals, some 200 years down the line. If you want to see them, you can. They're at the State Library of New South Wales, though understandably they're under lock and key because they're old. Um, I've asked for access, and they're going to get back to me at some point down the line. Hopefully someone can digitise them for me. Who knows, maybe this video will have a part two where I can read his own words and reveal something new about him, but it's hard for me being in New York to access them. Uh, that's it for another video though, guys. I hope you like hearing about Henry Antill in this one. If you did like it a lot, feel free to go to this, uh, the, the library and look at his documents and bring them back to me. Uh, something easier you could do is hit the like button on this video, s share it with your friends, uh, get my visibility out there. My next video could be about Fred Harris, Sydney's earliest commercial tattooist from about the early 1900s. Uh, or it could be about William Dawes, an astronomer in the first fleet coming into Sydney. Could even be about Bungaree, the first Australian to circumnavigate Australia. He was on Matty Flinders' boat. Um, maybe it'll be something entirely different. You could let me know something in the comments, which you want, uh, or just pick between the ones I've given you there, the options there. Uh, as always, I'll see you when I look at you, and uh, I hope you enjoyed.